Welcome. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and these are the lessons for the third quarter of 2012. And this particular series focuses on the teachings and the implications of the books of First and Second Thessalonians. This is lesson number eight in that series. It's entitled, The Dead in Christ, and it will focus on 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. But before we begin, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our loving Father, we recognize your loving presence with us at all times. We thank you for the ways in which you've guided us in, in this small group of friends as we study together. We ask that the words we speak, the thoughts that come into our minds as guided by your Holy Spirit may be a benefit to those who are listening wherever it might be around the world. Forgive us where we have failed to rip or represent you correctly. May we do better day by day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this particular lesson is going to focus on what is the most important and well-known off-quoted passage in the entire two books of First and Second Th Thessalonians. And it's going to focus on what happens to the dead, where they go when they die, and particularly what's going to happen to them when Jesus comes back. Let's take a quick look at those verses. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading from verse 13. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so he's setting up an example, right? We believe that Jesus died and he rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus, my version says, those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day when the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died, there will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. So, what do you think Paul wrote these words. What do you think was going on? My uh, translation, the NIV, uh, says, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant mm -hmm. without knowledge. Mm -hmm. not, not a judgmental ignorant, but just without knowledge about those who have fallen asleep. And then the NIV says, fallen asleep, not dead. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. seems like there was confusion and Paul wanted everyone to know exactly how it would take place. Yeah. Confusion. Uh, Jesus didn't say much about, uh, about those who were going to die and be resurrected. And well, he did. Some. Uh, Ma Mark 13, Matthew 24, Mar Luke 21. Um, well, John they expected the him to come back so quick yeah. that they were worried that those who were dying might, mm -hmm. they were unsure of their, of and, their fate. And why? I mean, Paul had only been away from Thessalon Thessalonica for just maybe weeks or a, a few months. Why is he talking peop about people who have died? Do you think there was terrible persecution in Thessalonica? Were the Christians being killed? It's a Greek philosophy that dealt with it. Mm -hmm. If you were good, you went to heaven. If you were bad, you went to hell. The soul got freed from the body, which was the only thing that died. Sounds r r vaguely familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. Well, well was, was Thessalonica kind of like Ephesus, and uh, where I understand that in Ephesus, anyway, they had lots of malaria, mm -hmm. and people were dying frequently. Mm -hmm. Disease was rampant. Yeah. Well, in this passage, we're going to focus on two or three important things for us to study, and I wanted to just to mention them in passing uh, so that you can sort of keep your ears open for them. We're going to talk about the identity of Michael the Archangel. We will discuss the various events connected with the second coming of Jesus, and we will also discover 
what implications are our understanding of these events might have for our day-by-day -day lives in the 21st century. So what happens to a person when she or he dies? Well, there are three common beliefs that need to be understood. So there's a lot of, a lot of disagreement about what happens to people when they die. One, the Sadducees, remember them? They were the priests of Jerusalem in, in Jesus' day. And many people today and many pagans believe that this life is the only life we will ever have. Thus they believe that when one dies, she or he stays dead a long time. That's it. You get this one life, when you're done, that's it. Two, the vast majority of modern Christians have adopted the Platonic Greek understanding of soul and body. Thus they believe that when a person dies, it's only the body that really dies. The soul escapes from the prison house of the body, and um, if the person is righteous, the soul goes to heaven. If the person is wicked and not eligible to go to heaven, the soul goes to hell where it suffers eternal torture and flames, etc. The Roman Catholic Church has added a third category. It was convenient to help to raise money at certain times. Those, <laughs> those who may not be righteous enough to go to heaven but are not wicked enough to go to hell are sent to a purgatory for a temporary period of correction. And then there are group, group three, others like Seventh-day Adventists, most of us, and the ancient Hebrews believe that, as Jesus stated in John 11, when a person dies, she or he is asleep in the grave until the resurrection morning. So, what do you think about those three different views? I think we can discover which one is the most accurate by going to the scripture. At least we ought to be able to figure out which one is the most biblical, shouldn't yes. we? Yes. Yeah. Often people question when Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, when Jesus, before he dies, he said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit, my soul. And they question exactly what does that mean. And is it congruent with the Seventh-day Adventist belief? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, do you understand these three views well enough so you can, uh, you can explain why each group believes what they believe? Not just why you believe what you believe, but why the others believe what they believe. You know, Paul has been teaching us that if you really want to reach people, you really want to try to help them understand, you need to understand where they are. You need to understand what their logic is, what their thinking is, so you have a chance to, to reach out to them. Well, um, can you clearly spell out from Scripture why you believe what you believe? Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus will return in a second coming, at which time the righteous dead will be raised, and along with the righteous living, be taken to heaven for a period of 1,000 years. Now, the resurrection part is clearly spelled out in the passage we're studying today. But the other part of that is spelled out in Revelation 20. And I, um, I want you to look at that. Look at Revelation 20, starting at verses 4 to 6. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed, because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed and the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. Now, many of our friends, Christian friends, aren't quite sure what to do with the book of Revelation. Now maybe that's why they're not sure what to do with the millennium. Okay? What does this say that the saints are going to be doing during the millennium? The word is used judge. Mm -hmm. what do you, what, we're told as humans that we don't have the ability to read the motives, therefore we should not judge. Okay. Does does this imply that uh, we're going to? It says we're going to give the be given the power to judge. Do you think that means we're going to be able, given the power to look into a person's life and read their motive? Well, that's possible. Sure. 
at least we're going to be able to see why God made the choice he did in the pre-advent judgment. Right? Well, they had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead. Happy and greatly blessed are those who are included in the first raising of the dead. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Now, there's something interesting I want to point out about this. After the thousand years, there will be a third coming when the new Jerusalem descends to this earth, making this earth the future headquarters of God's kingdom. At that third coming, all the wicked will be resurrected so that every human being who has ever lived will be alive on this earth at the same time. What many Adventists had not thought carefully through is that the teaching about the millennium, the thousand years, and the third coming is not found anywhere in Scripture until we reach the end of the book of Revelation where it was been described by John in the 90s A.D. So, as far as we know, Paul never knew <coughs> anything about the millennium or the third coming. Paul never knew anything about the millennium or the third coming. Why should that surprise me? Well, we, just, we tend to read through the Bible, even the Old Testament, we just sort of automatically assume that they have all the same understandings of everything that we have. Well, I mean, there was, there was John out there on that Isle of Patmos, yeah getting all kinds of vision from God, mm -hmm. why wouldn't he be given something that Paul didn't have? Sure, but that means when we read verses like I'm going to read to you right now from John chapter 5, 28 and 29, and, and things in the Old Testament, we need the people in the Old Testament, there's no evidence whatsoever in the Old Testament that the Old Testament people ever thought that there was going to be more than one coming. Okay. They thought everything was going to happen at the first coming of Christ. I mean, th then we should, it, it, that, it should be easier then for us to understand why the Jews believed, hey, Jesus is going to set up a kingdom, he's going to rule the world, and we're going to be a part of it. Okay. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's an important thing. Well, now notice John 5, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice. Now we would say, well, yeah, we understand that. The righteous dead will hear at, at the second coming. The wicked dead won't hear it until a thousand years later. Well, there's no hint of that here, even in John's Gospel. But there's nothing that precludes it. No. And come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live. Those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. And look at some other verses. Look at Daniel 12, verse 2. Many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life, and, those, and some will suffer eternal disgrace. But there's nothing in that talks about that would distinguish between those two. Well, but the point is, you certainly wouldn't automatically just throw in a thousand years. Right. No, but it's not precluded. No. Look at uh, tw Isaiah 26, verse 19. Those of our people who have died will live again. Their bodies will come back to life. All those sleeping in their graves will wake up and sing for joy. Now, see, it sounds like those of our people, that would be the righteous, presumably, will live again. And then all those sleeping in their graves will wake up and sing for joy. As the sparkling dew refreshes the earth, so the Lord will revive those who have long been dead. Sounds like everybody's going to come to going to be resurrected at the same time. And we believe that. 1 mm. Corinthians 15, 12 to 19, it's pretty much says the same thing. But mm. in, in verse 29, it talks about baptism for the dead. What mm. exactly is that? Yeah. <laughs> well, there were people who, in those days, and there are people today who are out there being getting baptized for the dead because they believe that that's going to do something. These verses that we've just read, mm -hmm. they say that everybody's going to be resurrected, mm -hmm. but they don't give a time frame in that. Mm -hmm. We have to bring that to the text. Yes. And so whatever our bias is, we bring to that, and this, this will support it. Mm -hmm. But we, we, need to, we need to recognize that that's our, our understanding, and it may not have been the understanding of Paul. Absolutely. So when we read Paul, yeah. let's, let's, let's allow for that kind of flexibility. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and about, we were just in Daniel a moment ago, chapter mm -hmm. 12, the very last sentence doesn't talk about the millennium, but it does say, as for you, Daniel, 
Go your way till the end, you will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Yeah. Sounds like everybody, yeah. not only Daniel, but we read in Isaiah and elsewhere. Yeah. Well, the Thessalonians clearly had some mistaken ideas about the condition of the dead, and presumably that's why Paul wrote this passage mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And what will happen on resurrection morning of the second coming? We do not know exactly what those mistaken ideas included. Notice the following suggestions, and, and this is, uh, you can find this in, in, in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, August 19. Within Judaism, now remember, the Thessalonians were, the Thessalonian church was primarily what kind of people? Gentiles. Greek Greeks. Gentiles, primarily. But here we're talking about Judaism. But it will give us a clue about some of the ideas that people might have had in that day. Within the Judaism of Paul's day, a variety of views regarding the end time were prevalent. One of these viewpoints, in some form, it crept into the Thessalonian church. Though we're not certain exactly what it was, it seems to have been the idea that though all of God's faithful would share in the world to come, in other words, all the faithful are going to rise and, be, and live for eternity, only those who are alive at the end would be carried up into heaven. Those who died before the end would be resurrected and remain on earth. In such a belief system, it would be a serious disadvantage to die before the end came. But it would also mean a separation between those taken to heaven and those left on earth. If the Thessalonians Paul was writing to lived until the end, they would truly ascend to heaven at the second coming of Jesus, but they would have to leave their deceased loved ones behind on earth. So where does he get that information? Do we, do we have any idea? Yeah, that's from uh, pagan sources uh, that, from mm -hmm. those days. All right. Yeah. But do we agree that all the apostles thought the second coming was imminent? They would see it. And I have to correct the statement I just made. This was, this was not talking about pagan sources. This is talking about uh, sources within Judaism. So it would be in the Talmud. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Yoli. No, but it seems like all the apostles thought the second coming was imminent. Even mm -hmm. Paul, they yeah. thought they were going to see it in their time. So. What about First John 2, verse 18? Yeah. It is the last hour. Yes. You know? That seems to be a characteristic of the Christian message throughout mm -hmm. time. Yeah. God says, don't ever live as if there's going to be a long time and just... Okay, you can do what you like with your wife because you don't know what's going to happen to you. And you as an individual, you've got just a short time. Mm -hmm. And your next thought mm -hmm. will be the, the second coming, no matter how many years or millennia transpire in between. Yeah. Well, we do not have the mistaken views of the Thessalonians clearly spelled out in any document available to us today. We, we don't know exactly yes. what they believed. But clearly what we do have is, is Paul's correction for those mistakes. Yeah. So now we need to try to figure out what was going on behind the scenes. I have suggested on several occasions that the Bible is kind of like a final examination. The difference is we're given the answers and we have to figure out what the questions were. We see what actually took place, what God did, we see what Satan did. Then we have to try to figure out, okay, what was going on behind the scenes that led to this particular collection of behaviors or behavior, single behavior? Mm -hmm. So here we are again, the same kind of thing. We don't know exactly what the Thessalonians believe. What we have is Paul's response to, to what happened. So he told them several things. Look, at one not to grieve as those who have no hope. This could, only, this could even imply that they believe that the dead would never be resurrected. Now we've talked about some possibilities. Maybe the dead are going to be resurrected, but they're not going to go to heaven. That's another possibility. Two, he promised them that just as Jesus had died and then rose from the dead, Christians have the promise that Jesus will come back and raise his faithful members to life again. So Paul says, look, we have the example of Jesus. He died, he was buried, Three days later, he was alive again. This is not unfathomable for Christians. Okay? Three, there will, be, there will not be a distinction in the resurrection between those who have died and those who live until the second advent. The dead will be resurrected to rise with the living 
to join Christ in the air. What he, what he is teaching is quite independent of what they thought. It, but it responds to their, their errors. But I don't need to know their error in order yeah. to get the message that, no. that he's trying to no. teach. No, no. Uh, we all need the message he's trying to teach. Right. Yeah. Well, four. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we have a privilege that they did not have that we're able to learn heuristically. We to go back and do research and uh, apply things and understand things, but they didn't have that view. Yeah. And, it was yeah. and they did. Remember, we sit here and I, on, my, on my computer here, I can push a button. I can look at maybe 40 different translations of the English. And then I've got the Hebrew. I've got the original Greek. I've got Arabic. I've got German. I've got all that stuff right here. I can just push a button. There it is. They didn't even have a single copy. Probably the entire church at Thessalonica didn't have an entire Old Testament. I mean, think of the advantages that we have. Eh. Maybe. Incredible. I mean, they were very, very close to the reality. Mm -hmm. And they probably talked to people who saw it, and they could quiz them, and they could see the documents that they were looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that we have it so much better. Well, that's a good question. God says, okay, <coughs> blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Yeah, that's the point, because it's tougher on those who, who weren't there. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we shouldn't have too much trouble with that. Paul, as well as the believers in Thessalonica, apparently believed that these events would take place very soon. Well, what difference does this passage, this passage of Scripture make in the way you live every day? Do you live your life in light of the fact that Jesus is coming very soon? What difference would it make in your life if, if suddenly we got an official word from God through some channel that says, okay, you've got one year left? What would you do differently? Who was it? There was some, some saint or some, some, somebody who was asked that question. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, and what if Jesus is going to come tomorrow? What if so tomorrow is going to come I'd tomorrow? I'd garden. finish hoeing my garden. Yeah. Now that was um, Augustine, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I well, guess, uh, what did that mean? Did that mean business as usual? He felt that he was already kind of there. Apparently. So he, he would just keep doing what he, he was he doing. He felt exactly like every right. day he was doing the right thing to prepare himself for the second coming, apparently. I guess he didn't feel that he had a bunch of cherished sin that he'd need to get rid of if Christ was going to come. In other he words, he had... He was about Jesus checking his refrigerator. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, or, or, the, or the magazine rack or the whatever, or, right. or, the, or what's on his computer at home or is on his TV. Well, in light of all that, we're, we're, we're looking at prophecy here, right? This is prophecy. Okay, looking at this prophecy, what, what, what's the purpose of prophecy in the Bible? So when things happen, we can say, aha, that's what, what was meant. To increase our faith? That too. This well, this is what Jesus said to his disciples on the last night before he was crucified. I tell you, this is John 13, 19, and the same thing basically is said in John 14, 29, and again in John 16. I tell you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. I tell you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, in other words, prophecy is not for the purpose of letting us write tomorrow's newspaper. Prophecy is for the purpose for us to say, oh, look at that. God knew about that in advance, didn't he? Hmm. Guess but, what? He can he, predict the future. But he couldn't tell. I mean, you couldn't have that reaction if he hadn't told you what was going to happen. Yeah, the point exactly. Yeah. So yeah. what's the difference? I mean, you, you said prophecy is not to give well, us the to write the future, okay, but to help a, us recognize it. So what's the distinction? Okay, there's a very important distinction. There are all kinds of people in our world who want to read these things and they want to parse them and they want to dig around and they're going to say, aha, it's going to be in 2016, I know it. Oh. No, that's not what the purpose of prophecy is. Okay. 
The purpose of prophecy is to say, okay, when we see events trending in a certain direction, we read our Bible and say, aha, the time is coming. The time is coming. Each time we do that, we say, okay, this is going to happen this date or that date. Uh, usually we are disappointed, and yes. rightly so, because God said uh, the time or the hour no one will know or should know. Mm -hmm. So when we do those things, we basically tell, ask, telling God he's a liar. Now, and there's another reason why I think we need to be aware of this, and this is a little bit tricky. But let me, let's just put it out, and we're going to maybe talk about it if we have time a little bit later. We're talking about uh, absolute universe-changing, world-changing, cosmos-changing event when Jesus comes again. Yeah. I can't go to my scientific, experiment, my scientific friends and say, could you, could you do a study on the second coming? It, it hasn't happened before. There's, nothing, there's no way to study it. Well, there's no easy way to study it. That would be like asking the antediluvians to do a scientific study on the flood. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, wh how, wh why do we choose to believe this outrageous kind of stuff? <laughs> because there was a flood, and it was predicted by the, same, by the same person who's predicting this. Not only that, there's a whole string of prophecies, right. and every single one of them has come true. That's right. Every single one of them has come true. So it's not quite so crazy to believe outrageous things if you've got a track record, a history, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gordon, you look like you're about to say something. Nope. Well, how many times do you suppose Paul actually managed to meet with the believers in Thessalonica before he had to leave? Remember, he's only there for about three weeks. So how many meetings do you suppose he had with the Thessalonians? Yeah, five days a week. Five days a week? Yeah. Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe even more. Maybe all day. Yeah. yeah. Well, in that short period of... So here's the question. We're, the, the, I'm, we're trying to reconstruct the situation here. In that short period of time, how many of the details that we understand about Scripture and about the teachings of Jesus did he have a chance to discuss with them? Do you well, think he, he certainly didn't have revelation to discuss with no. them. No. He certainly didn't. None of the New Testament was available. Paul used to say that he would reason from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. <coughs> showing the people that the Christ had indeed come. Mm -hmm. Well, the mystery religions in Paul's day, remember there were, there were groups of religions that, yeah. that believed they were sort of Gnostic in orientation, and they, they said, you know, if you do all these things and you pay this money and you go through all this stuff and da 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 da, you will tell you the secrets. That's why they were called the mystery religions. We'll tell you the secrets you need to be saved. Isn't that the ba basis of Gnosticism? Well, not a hundred percent, but yeah, it's closely related. Yeah. yeah. The person who really knows yeah. the Gnostic yeah. is he's on the inside. He's track. On the inside. I know, and you don't know. Just like a bunch of little kids right. like, I know something that you don't know, you know? Right. Secret well, societies. Secret societies, yeah. While the mystery religions in Paul's day often offered some glimmer of hope for a future life, and that was one of their uh, yeah. pro promotional things, most of the pagan religions of Paul's day had no such hope. We've already mentioned that briefly. They believed that when one died, she or he just was just dead for a long time. Note these words in a letter from the second century. So now we're back within, you know, no more than 100 and some, 120 or 30 years at the very most from Paul's day when he was writing. And you want to compare these with 1 Thessalonians 4.18. What kind of comfort could you give to a mother who had lost a son who believes that once you die, you're dead? And here's the words. Uh, it, this, doesn't, this is not the way we would say it, but try to follow the logic here. Irene to Tanophorus and Philo, good comfort. I am as sorry and weep over the departed one as I wept over Didymus. And all things whatsoever were fitting, I have done in all mine, Epaphroditus and Thermuthion and Philion and Apollonius and Plantus. But nevertheless, against such things, one can do nothing. Therefore, comfort ye one another very well. 
So do you think all these people that were mentioned, Didymus and all of the rest of those, were people who had died? Well, and, either that and, or and, they're and family he, members of, of whoever this lady is, uh, of, of Irene, who are all weeping because someone has died, possibly. But notice what she said. And all mine. Mm -hmm. Could did, be, did, could did, be. did they, they, they were people that in be. his family that had died, yeah, and be. so he's emphasizing yeah. with, with their problem. Yeah. Well, it may be true that from a human perspective, when we die, that is the end. From a Christian perspective, we have the potential of being resurrected and living forever. Well, how much evidence can you provide from Scripture that the dead are just sleeping? May I read something yeah. from John chapter 6? Okay. Um, John chapter 6 from verse 39 to verse 44. Jesus says three times the same, the same thing. He says it three times. Um, and this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. That's what, and then he repeats that in the other scriptures, and I will raise them up at the last day, and I will raise them up at the last day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds to me, according to Jesus, that we're going to be raised up at the last day. Not before, not after, but at the last day. Very good point. Well, look at some <coughs> places that suggest that, that the dead are just sleeping. John 11, of course, is a classic case. Look at it starting with verse 11. Jesus said this and then added, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. The disciples answered, If he's asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I am glad that I was not with him, so that you will believe. Let us go to him, and so forth. Okay? So that's a classic case. Look at some other places. Matthew 27, 52. The graves broken open, and many of God's people that who have died were raised to life. They left the graves, and after Jesus rose from death, they went into the holy city where many people saw them. Okay? Look at some other places. Mark 5, 39. He went in. This is talking about the young lady, um, Jairus' daughter. He went in and said to them, Why all this confusion? Why are you crying? The child is not dead. She's only sleeping. And they laughed at him, of course, so he put them all out took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and went into the room where the children, child was lying. He took the girl by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I tell you to get up. Now, if you have the power to do that kind of stuff, what do you call death? Sleep. It's asleep. Yeah, exactly. Well, others, Luke 8, 52, Acts 7, 60, 13, 36, 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at the 1 Corinthians 15 passages. Those are interesting. Then Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have, my version says, died. The more traditional versions say, have fallen asleep. Okay? Well, we usually call something that you can wake up from sleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, Somebody gives you an anesthetic. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they put them to sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, it would also mean that the believers in Christ who have, di who have died, who have fallen asleep, are lost. And then he goes on, if our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death as a guarantee of those who sleep in death will also be raised. Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of passages in Scripture suggesting that sleep, I mean, that death is nothing more than a sleep. A little longer than usual. But a little longer. <laughs> Probably more comfortable, too. Probably, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We believe, look at 1 Thessalonians 4.14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus, my version says. Some of you are going to have versions which are very different than that will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. Why are the, if you look in several different versions, why do some versions, such as the King James, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the Message Bible, the New Living Translation, so you see we've got some very old translations and some very up to, 
excuse me, up-to-date translations suggest that Jesus will bring with him the dead who have died. Other versions, like the one I just read, the Good News Bible suggests he will take them back. So how could, how could there be confusion? Bring with him or take them back? How could there be that be mixed up? Depends on which direction you're talking about. Okay, but and then, I mean, if I may, in that same uh, scripture there, the same book, chapter four, but just a little bit further, it explains it. It said exactly that, and then in verse sixteen, uh, for the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. Okay. So that's, it's the same thing. We just read another, the next yeah, sentence and, exactly. and it clarifies it. Well, in modern English wording, these two views, these two expressions seem to be directly contradictory in terms of translation. But in the Greek, the verb ago, means to direct, guide, or lead, without any specific reference to direction to or from. So this leaves it open for the translators to translate it in the way that seems correct to them, based on their understanding of the rest of Scripture. So some people say he's going to bring them down with him. Other people say, no, they're asleep in the grave. He's going to take them back with him. Well, those of us who believe that the dead are asleep in their graves... <coughs> We believe this is strongly supported by such passages as, as, and look at these, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. But the truth is that Jesus has been raised from death as a guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. For just as death came by means of a man, in the same way the rising from death comes by means of a man. For just as all people die because of their union with Adam, in the same way all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. But each one will be raised in the right order. Christ first of all, then at the time of his coming, those who belong to him. Now, in light of our, our previous discussion, at the time of his coming, those who belong to him. But now, that doesn't say anything about those that don't belong yeah, to him. Yeah, it doesn't. So, so, and the, then, and then, so the, quote, simpler, end quote, Greek language that this was written in mm -hmm. doesn't have the complexities of, or the specifics of go go to heaven or uh, originally or come. Or, or come See, all heaven. of our all of our words of, of movement tend to have a direction connected to them go means you leave me you go come means see they have a direction as well as a movement bring take see, he will bring take. them back to heaven yeah well <laughs> that's not the way you would say it well listen to this secret truth and my first question would be, why is this a secret truth when it talks about the resurrection? It's a, in the Greek, it's mystery. Listen to this mystery. To us, somewhat unfathomable. Unfathom mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to... How is to God going to bring people back to life? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's still a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> but we shall not all die. So where are you reading from? I'm reading 1 Corinthians 15. Now I'm reading in verses 51 to uh, 58. Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again, and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, that is, what can't die, then the scripture will, become, will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory? Where death is your power to hurt? Death gets its power to hurt from sin, and sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and steady. Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. Okay? Question. Yeah. John 10, 35 states that Scripture cannot be broken. Okay. Um, 
basically if it says one thing about a topic when you go someplace else it should be say pretty much the same so the part that say that says uh, when the dead in Christ are raised you know they're gonna go to heaven and the other ones that did wrong they will be condemned is that antithetical to uh, salvation by grace through Christ or no is that referring to that? Is that what you're saying? No, question? is it contrary to that? No, I don't think so. Is it, does it oppose that? No, I think this is just the results of that. Okay. The salvation yeah. which comes, the healing which comes, yeah. yeah, is a result of our relationship to Christ. Yeah, the wordings are something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, Paul clearly didn't have any way to explain how God was going to bring people back to life, but that's all right, we don't either. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look at chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. Now, we've already talked about the fact that we don't know where exactly he got this information, but we, we believe he got it somehow or other from another source and that was Jesus' teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Okay? Well, in these verses we have an interesting situation. There are many sayings of Jesus about the second coming and the resurrection recorded in places like Matthew 24, Mark 31, Luke 21, and even John 14, for example. But none of them match this passage in 1 Thessalonians. Were there some other writings spelling out the words of Jesus that Paul had access to which are no longer available? Or was this information personally passed on to Paul by some of the apostles who had been with Jesus? Another clear example of this kind of quotation for, from Jesus is found in Acts 20, verse 35. And this is an interesting one. This is Paul's comments. I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak, remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said. Now he's quoting. There is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And where is that in the Gospels? Not there. Better to give than to receive? It's not in the Gospels. Is that in Proverbs? Well, there's something close to it in Proverbs, yeah. So what exactly will happen when Jesus comes back the second time? Do we know, do we understand the sequence of events so as we see these things unfolding, we'll know at least what's coming next? Well, for one thing, the second coming is going to be a brilliant and noisy event. Everyone who's alive will see it, and those who are raised in the special resurrection will also see it. And lots of references for that. One of the most important probably is Revelation 1-7. Look, he's coming in the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him, so shall it be, and so forth. But won't even the, those righteous who are resurrected see him coming? Yeah. yeah. So ev everybody who is going to go to heaven will have the opportunity to see him come. Matthew 24, 31 says, The great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Imagine rising out of your grave, and there's an angel. <laughs> saying, come with me, please. Mm. Wouldn't that be something? Yes. And we already read John. Peterson mm -hmm. Go ahead. makes this point. He says, uh, Master comes again to get us. Those of us who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they'll be ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Where does he get that? <coughs> well, he says, those who are dead in Christ will rise first. That's what the scripture says. Well, does that mean come out of their graves? Or does that mean well, go up to him? Well. Pay yeah. your money, take your choice? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Acts 9. We, should, we need to read this passage because it's a very famous one. Acts 1, verses 9 to 11. After saying this, now Jesus has gone with his disciples. They've traveled from the city, out of the city of Jerusalem, down across the Kidron Valley, up over the edge of, up over the top of the Mount of Olives, and slightly down on the other side. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from their sight. 
By the way, what was that cloud that all of a sudden showed up? Angels. A whole cloud of angels. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away, when two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them, and I'm sure this was not just ordinary white, and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. So what was the way in which he went to heaven? In a cloudy chariot. In a cloudy chariot, and he's going to come down, and there he's going to be. And there will be, Ellen White says, there will be angels completely filling the sky. Try to imagine what that would look like. Wow. Well, you could even stretch that to where the universe mm -hmm. will be empty because... Who There's, doesn't want to be a part of it? Who doesn't want to be a part of it? There's silence in heaven for a space of a half an hour. Yeah. Uh, maybe everyone in the universe, every intelligent creature, is going to be want to come in on this biggest event in the universal history. Yeah. I I don't I don't know how God could like not allow them to come. They'd probably feel bad if they weren't there. Sorry, you got to so stay like, home and keep the, you gotta keep watch the fire the gates. going up in heaven. Huh? You know, I was like, well, I'd really like to be there, you know. And if maybe if we're all down here, snake, uh, Satan will sneak into heaven and eat from the tree of life, right? Not much of a chance. Not no much chance. of a chance? Well, another thing, that, question that rises out of this chapter was, who is Michael the archangel? Jesus. The one that we call Jesus now, anyway. And how are you going to demonstrate that? His name, the descriptive Hebrew name, Michael, who was like God. We just read uh, uh, Daniel, I mean, sorry, First Thessalonians 4. And let's just look at it again really quick. Um, First Thessalonians 4, 14. It says, there will be, the, this is verse 16, there will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet. Okay? Who's, whose voice is it? Michael. The archangel's voice, right? Master himself will give the command. Okay. Archangel thunder, God's trumpet blast. Mm -hmm. those are the, those are, that's saying the same thing twice, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Because over in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, it says, Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice. Whose voice? The Lord himself. He's talking about the Son of Man yeah. in the previous verse and come out of their graves, those who have done good. So proof that Michael the archangel is that you just have to compare 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and John 5, 28 and 29. But there's more to it than that. And those of you who have been in this class for a while have heard this argument before, this explanation. What is the name Michael? Well, let's just look at a few other places where Michael, the word term Michael is used. Look at Jude 9. Not even the chief angel Michael did this in his quarrel with the devil. So what's the context here? Christ and the devil. Yeah. The combat between the real one who is like God and the one who is not like God but wants to be like God. Okay. When they argued about who would be, have the body of Moses, Michael did not dare to condemn the devil with insulting words but said, the Lord rebuke you. Just stand back for a little bit. I've got a job to do here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, have, I always chuckle. You know, we, 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 we talk about the, 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 the hundred soldiers that were guarding Jesus' tomb yeah. and how they fell like dead men. They, wow, wasn't that impressive? I can tell you every single angel on the devil's side in the great controversy was there trying to keep that grave shut. Every single one. God sent two angels down from heaven. You read about this in Desire of Ages. Two angels down from heaven, and as they just came shooting down there straight for the tomb of Jesus, and what happened to all those wicked angels? They scattered. Bye-bye. They could not resist the power and might of the, the, the truth. And one of those angels rolled back the stone, and the other one says, Jesus, your Father's calling you. And Jesus came forth in his own power. For the first time in 33 years, he used his divine power yeah. to rise from the dead. So, in the, in the Hebrew, Michael means the one who is like God or who is like God. Uh, a couple of other examples of the use of that. Daniel 10, verse 13. Now here, 
uh, some translations aren't quite sure what to do with this. The angel prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief angels, here's the Michael, the archangel again, came to help me because I've been left there alone in Persia. And one other passage, Daniel 12, verse 1. The angel wearing linen clothes said, At that time, the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. <coughs> then there will be times of trouble and the worst since nations, so forth and so forth. Who's going to stand up to signal the end of all event, the ends of this earth's history? Jesus, right? So clearly these verses are based on a great controversy theme. Uh, the conflict between the true and the false. Well, another interesting point in these two verses is at the end of verse 15. And here you'll need to look at maybe some different versions. Maybe I just, to make, a, to make our point, we should read from the King James, just to look at this. Look at uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, look at, um, you need to get to the right place, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses, verse 15. And King James says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Does this mean that the, the righteous living are going to say, You get back in the, what's the what, get, get back in your grave. What are you trying to do? Get out, getting out of your grave. Old English means proceed. Old English. Okay. So, prevent, vent is the Latin word for go or come. So, okay, we're not somehow going to prevent. This, of course, sounds completely crazy. At the time of the second coming, can you imagine one of the 144,000 trying to prevent a former state, saint from rising from the grave? This can be easily explained by an understanding of the change in the meaning of the word prevent. In the days when the King James Version was translated, Prevent meant to proceed, or to go ahead, or go, to go before, or go ahead. The King James Version was not incorrect in its day. The meaning of prevent has just changed in the last 400 years. So we need to keep that in mind when we read certain versions. Well, look at Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. We looked at this once before. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed in the word of God. And it goes down, dropping down, they came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead, happy and greatly best of those who are, in, are included in this first ri raising of the dead. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Okay? So in these verses, we notice... Uh, the very first mention of reigning with Christ in heaven for a thousand years, otherwise called the millennium. Of course, the Latin for a thousand years is millennium. Apparently, Paul had no understanding of the millennium. So at the second coming, every eye will see Jesus coming in the sky, Revelation 1-7. The righteous dead will be brought back to life. The living righteous will be given immortality. And all of them will join Jesus as he returns to heaven. The vo those of us who are modern Christians believe in testing everything. Paul told us to do that, didn't he? Remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 21? We're going to come up, we're going to come on that one really quickly. In just a chapter or so. Do not restrain the Holy Spirit. Do not despise inspired messages. Put all things to the test. Keep what is good. Okay? Or isn't that what we're supposed to do? 1 John 4, 1 says the same thing, basically. Can we believe in such an outrageous sequence of events which seems to be completely contrary to any science that we might yet know about. Are there other things mentioned in Scripture that seem to be inconsistent with modern science? And of course, we've already mentioned creation and the flood story. So, in, in these final verses, let's look at them quickly. Verses 17 and 18, 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. Uh, John 14, let's look at that, 1 to 3. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And what's the point of him coming to this earth? What's the point of him going and preparing places 
if he doesn't plan to come and take us there, right? Mm -hmm. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads and so forth and so forth. So, the righteous dead will be gathered by the angels from all corners of the earth. Jesus will come back in visible form just as he went up to heaven at his ascension. The only direction of travel for the saints is upward, right? As we noted in Revelation 20, they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. It is only after this millennium that the new, earth, new Jerusalem will come down to become a permanent part of this earth. 2 Peter 3.13 and Revelation 3.12. So how do you understand these words from Ellen White? But one after another, uh, talking about the Thessalonians now, one after another, their loved ones have been taken from them, and with anguish the Thessalonians had looked for the last time upon the faces of their dead, hardly daring to hope to meet them in the future life. Now this sounds like there's a lot of persecution going on. Yeah. As Paul's epistles were opened and read, great joy and consolation was brought to the church by the words revealing the true state of the dead. Paul showed that those living in Christ should come, those living in Christ should come, would not go to meet their Lord in advance of those who had fallen asleep in Jesus. Acts of the Apostles 2.58. So in this lesson is clearly pointed out that death for God's friends is nothing more than a temporary separation, a temporary sleep. So could you list in order the exact events connected with the second coming? of Jesus. Having said all this about the resurrection, we need to remember that death here on this earth is at the same rate it always has been, one per customer. <laughs> in Paul's day, many children died at a very young age. Even many adults died in their 20s and 30s. The average life expectancy was very low. They did not have the advantages of modern medicine that we have. So having read all these verses, the Greek word parousia is there, and it talks about the coming. And Paul says, this coming, it was used, it, this was a word used to describe the time when maybe the emperor came to visit you. But in this case, Paul is talking about someone who's far superior to the emperor. Who's coming? Jesus. He uses this word parousia to talk about the coming, the very presence of Jesus Christ himself. And he says, it's going to happen at the second coming. You, if you're righteous, will be there, you will see it happen, and you will be taken up in heaven. It is my prayer that every one of you watching will be with all of us on that day.